Uh, my name is Karan. I'm a, I'm a program manager at the uh, Azure Compute team, uh, and we're part of the Azure Big Compute team, in fact, um, in the HPC team. Uh, and we're responsible for some of the platform services and uh, some of the accelerated infrastructure. So today we're going to talk about, obviously, GPUs. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, the AI service, which is going to be covered by Alex, um, who's my colleague um, in the team. Um, so what I wanted to do was, uh, you know, there's always sort of these, you know, vision slides and things like that. But uh, it really is really important for us from our, from our team's perspective because, um, you know, although we are part of compute, we, we think about things a little bit differently. Uh, because we are uh, responsible for the accelerated hardware, uh, we do want to think about things such as, um, you know, no compromise infrastructure. That's really important for some of our customers that are running really high-end HPC applications, uh, you know, or even things like deep learning, machine learning workloads. Um, we are investing in scale up and scale out. Uh, uh, certainly with scale out with some of our uh, networking infrastructure uh, that we'll talk about. Um, and we want to get to the near bare metal performance as possible because most of our customers are running bare metal on-prem. Uh, and they're, when they look to switch to Azure, they're always sort of comparing these benchmarks and workloads. And so we want to make sure that we get close to that possible uh, as much as possible. And the delta is really, really small. Um, and then we're investing in our ecosystem of partners. So we've got really strong relationships with NVIDIA. We've got really strong relationships with Mellanox and a bunch of other partners that I'll talk about. Um, and we're really leveraging those to make sure that we, we give uh, the best infrastructure there. Um, and then additionally, you know, we want to enable the true HPC in the cloud. Um, yes, today, you know, most people sort of go through a transition of, of different types of, uh, uh, you know, workloads where they're on, on, on premise and then they go pure IaaS or then they go hybrid. Uh, we want to truly enable the full HPC infrastructure in the cloud where you're uh, creating your assets or your data sets in the cloud, you're processing them in the cloud, and then you're visualizing them in the cloud as well. So let's do a quick recap um, of what Azure's got today. Um, and you know, I'll kind of you know, run by this stuff pretty quickly because um, you, you've probably sort of seen this stuff uh, before. So to start off with, um, you know, we've got two, two separate offerings. Uh, the first one being is the uh, NV-based instances. You've probably heard about these before. Um, these are the uh, virtual machines that enable Quadro-based uh, uh, workloads, VDI or workstation in the cloud. Um, they're powered by NVIDIA's Tesla M60 card. Uh, and so this card is a dual GPU design. So what that means is a single physical board, and it's got two GPUs on it. So when I say that we've got one M60 up to all the way to four M60s, um, it means half a card, single card, two full cards uh, in a single VM. Um, additionally, uh, those cores, just FYI, are, are uh, uh, physical cores and not hyper-threaded cores. Um, again, uh, a very important distinction uh, uh, from some other competitors. Um, and then we also enable quarter licensing. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But essentially, what we're trying to do is the the main the main purpose of having that VM in the cloud was. Um, you know, lots of people do simulations or rendering or different types of workloads in the cloud. Um, and they were having to move this ginormous amount of data on-prem. And it sort of defeated the purpose of having the uh, uh, data produced in the cloud because they had to keep moving it back and forth. So we wanted to enable a VM where they could essentially spin it up, look at their data, uh, visualize it, um, and then iterate on it. And so we obviously introduced the NV sizes. Um, now, what's happened is, as a side effect, is that people now realize, hey, if I'm visualizing my outputs in the cloud, I can certainly create my inputs in the cloud. So people are now actually using these uh, VMs for VDI infrastructure. Uh, they're using it for things like you know, creating digital assets for movie scenes or things like that, or even creating data, data sets in, in other scenarios like oil and gas. Um, so we wanted to enable sort of you know, everything in the cloud so that people are able to do, or uh, engineers and designers and artists and uh, you know, data scientists can do everything directly in the cloud. There's no on-prem infrastructure at all. Um, obviously, that's not true today, but that's kind of where we're headed with this. Um, graphics are required for more workloads. So some of the latest, um, you know, um, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, Internet Explorer, Chrome, all of those things are actually graphics accelerated these days. Um, a lot of different types of applications, um, such as Autodesk products, uh, Adobe products, Katia, um, most of the auto, uh, automotive manufacturers are actually using very highly intensive, uh, graphics intensive applications in the cloud. And you can certainly use those on the M60. Um, and so the layering, the, the, the way the layering actually works is obviously we've got the Azure IS layer in the bottom, and then we attach the GPUs on it, and then what we've got is a Quadro driver. 
Now, the cool thing here is that traditionally today, you have to go to a third party, obviously NVIDIA in this case, to go and buy the driver from them and pay them based on a certain metric. Um, what we enable inside Azure is, is uh, essentially seamless. So what that means is there's no license service to set up. There's none of, that, um, none of that complexity at all. You just launch the VM, you install the driver, and then you're good to go. Um, the licensing cost is actually incorporated into the compute cost of the VM, which is pretty awesome. So again, um, as I mentioned, you can, you, can, you, know, you can run Siemens NX, you can run 3DS Excite, um, you can run all these uh, you know, really graphical intensive works that, uh, workloads directly in Azure. Um, and so I wanted to talk about partner solutions because <clears throat> obviously you can use things like RDP directly into these VMs, uh, but most, most of the folks are using sort of partner solutions. And so, you know, we announced um, uh, uh, with Teradici actually at last build that Teradici would be supported on top of Azure. So there you, you're able to use our cloud access software directly onto Azure. Um, you can even launch it as an extension, as a VM extension directly onto the VM in a single script. So you launch a VM, it installs the driver, installs the extension, and you have essentially a Teradici infrastructure in the cloud. We also support Citrix, so ZenApp and Zen, uh, Zen Desktop support was announced by Citrix on N-Series, specifically NV-based instances, uh, last Ignite in September. Um, so you, know, you can run traditional Citrix-based um, uh, infrastructure directly on top of that. Um, and then recently, uh, if anybody checked into a GPU technology conference earlier this week, we also had Frame on stage uh, showing their, uh, their browser-based uh, workstation uh, uh, offering directly um, on these NC NV series. And so what it is is you can app access all of those applications that I talked about directly from uh, uh, from a browser or even, uh, you know, even an app from one of your um, uh, one of your um, uh, devices, which is which is really really cool because you could sort of take it on the go, um, and then on the back end you can even connect your applications up to an Azure you know HPC cluster or a compute cluster. So you've essentially got uh, you know a a supercomputer in your pocket, so to speak. The second set of offerings uh, that we announced at the same time as NV was NC. These are uh, applica these are these are VMs that uh, that that expose CUDA and uh, OpenCL based workloads on top of them. Um, again, it's exactly the same as the N NV series, meaning that you get uh, similar configuration. However, it's backed by a, a NVIDIA Tesla K80 GPU. Again, a dual GPU device. So when I say one K80, it actually means half a card. Um, <clears throat> additionally, you can see at the far end of the table, we've got an additional size, which is exactly the same. The only difference here is that the networking. So we have a second backend network, which is enabled by Mellanox's InfiniBand uh, uh, networking infrastructure. Um, and this is really primarily for uh, you know, workloads that take, uh, you know, take up multiple sets of VMs and you, re you, re you really need low latency and high bandwidth. And so we're seeing about less than two microseconds of latency between a server to a server. So think about all of the deep learning, the machine learning stuff you've, uh, you've heard at Build um, over the last couple of days. Um, you can certainly now expand on those jobs and utilize these VMs for not only multi-GPU in a single node, but multiple GPUs across multiple nodes. So you can start stringing together hundreds of GPUs for a single job um, that are all working in parallel together. So um, that, that's pretty exciting. And you know, Azure is the only cloud provider today to provide um, infinite band infrastructure as part of our VMs. Um, so that's, that's really cool. Um, whoops. So State of the Union. So I wanted to sort of cover you know, what's happened since we released these VMs. Uh, we've had thousands and thousands of customers uh, come in and use these things during preview, which was last year. And then we GA'd, meaning general availability, public, uh, public general availability since December 1st. Now, we've had such a massive demand um, that we've had a constraint of capacity, and we're working through that as quickly as possible. So um, in the next slide, you'll see you know, how in the future we're going to be deploying additional clusters um, uh, in the coming months. Um, and you know, these, these GP offerings are really our sort of a base layer of innovation moving forward for any future offerings as well. So uh, you know, this, is, this is a collaboration between Windows Server, our Hyper-V team, which is Hyper-V, uh, our Linux, uh, Linux, Linux guys in Azure, and then us as well. So it really is at the forefront of innovation as well. And most of our, uh, you know, now our internal products are running on these GPUs as well. So if you're using these VMs, most likely is our internal teams are using these VMs as well for similar type of services. So uh, one particular one I want to point out was Chris.ai, which is a new speech uh, translation service that's 
part of the cognitive toolkit, oh, sorry, uh, cognitive uh, services ecosystem. Um, and that's completely built on top of our Azure N series. They're actually doing the training directly on top of the K80s. Um, since, since the general availability, uh, we've got hundreds and hundreds of customers that are in production live, uh, that are running production mission critical workloads. <clears throat> and then AI and deep learning is really driving a lot of growth. Um, obviously, the sort of the theme of you know, a lot of keynotes um, on Wednesday was, was AI and deep learning. And that really seems to be driving a lot of our, uh, our demand and workload uh, uh, iteration. So um, you know, these, are, these are a couple of the uh, uh, you know, different regions that we're going to be deploying these, these servers into. Um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, the, the deployments will vary between you know, NV and NC based on, uh, based on where you are. Uh, they're, they're obviously separate offerings, so we're going to be you know, expanding those to different regions. Um, and again, you know, the, this, the, the pain on sort of getting more and more is going to get alleviated by the end of the year when we have lots more data centers supported with these GPUs. Um, so talk a little bit about under the covers, you know, what happens under the covers, because this is quite important on how we expose these GPUs. Um, so under the covers, we have, you know, at the bottom layer, we've got the hardware, obviously. We've got our clusters in our data centers that we deploy with racks and racks of different servers. Um, and those servers then contain either the M60 GPU or the K80 GPU, uh, similar to some of the, some of the other, uh, um, you know, other providers. And then on top of that, we have our host OS. Now today, most of our host OSs are running Server 2012. Uh, in the case of GPUs, we're running Server 2016 as, as part of our host OS layer. Now as part of that host OS layer and as part of our hypervisor, which is Hyper-V, it exposes a thing called DDA, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and then from DDA, we are allowed to expose our GPUs directly to the guest. So the guest can be obviously Linux, Windows, um, and then you can run it on, you know, obviously M60 or K80. Uh, and then you can bring your own images, your, your, you can build services on top of it. Um, you can even, uh, you can, hello, oh, you can even deploy Azure Marketplace images as well. Um, so DDA, DDA is uh, discrete device assignment. So essentially what it allows us to do is take a couple of PowerShell scripts and then allow us to take a PCIe device, directly assign it to, uh, to a guest. So it's essentially a PCI pass-through. Um, what it allows us to do is, because we're attaching a physical device to a VM, it allows us to, to run the native driver on the VM itself uh, for, for, for the device. Um, and what that means is we get really, really good performance because you're essentially getting a physical device um, hooked onto a VM. Now, the cool thing is that DDA is actually available as part of Server 2016 release uh, in general. So what that means is you can actually run your stack on-prem using Server 2016, the same technology that we've got in Azure as well. So you can you know, bring up a server, run 2016 on it, uh, put some PCIe devices or GPUs on it, and then use these commands to essentially expose your device directly onto a VM, which is pretty cool. Uh, what that means is, uh, you know, this is just a little screenshot of a, of a, of a, of a device, device manager that is showing you uh, the devices that are directly attached. Obviously, based on the VM that you'll pick, you'll be able to get one, two, or four GPUs, um, you know, attached to those devices. And so this is really cool because, um, you know, you're essentially getting the full power of a device. You know, it's not virtualized, uh, so you can really take advantage of the power of the GPU. Um, some real-world case studies. Um, we've actually published some of these online, so I'd, I really recommend that you go check these out. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is City of Hope. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is one of the top um, cancer research institutes in America. And what they're doing is they're doing a lot of different types of protein and DNA analysis on top of Azure K80 GPUs, um, and which is very compute intensive. Now, the really, the really important part here is, I mean, if you look at the bottom, uh, the bottom thing that they're saying here, we're not shorter than ideas, just computers. It's pretty powerful. They're using this stuff to solve you know, uh, research on cancer. Um, and additionally, they actually also even do things like deep learning, where they're taking, uh, where they're taking effects of drugs on patients, and then taking the history of that, and then trying to predict how a patient would react to a future, future iteration of that drug. So, again, this is published online, so I'd go check it out. Uh, it actually describes how they use the K80s uh, in specific. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting thing to look at. 
Um, Audio Boost is another, is another one. They're essentially using both M60s and K80s. They're using the M60s from a uh, transcoding and also streaming point of view. So they're actually using the visualization VMs to stream their content directly uh, uh, to, the, to the device. And then they're using the K80s for things like deep learning, where they're essentially turning all of the video content into closed captions and then having the customers go in and say, they can say, hey, where is, you know, uh, you know, you can, you can sort of obviously uh, put in whatever topic that you like, and it'll actually go in, look at the database, and then go give you all the results directly into the video. Uh, Jellyfish Pictures is a pretty, pretty fun one. Um, this is a, uh, uh, this is a uh, visual effects studio based in London, um, and they're an Emmy and BAFTA award-winning studio. Uh, they actually worked on the latest uh, Star Wars movies as well. And what they're doing is they're using the M60s for their distributed artists. So they have artists all over the world um, that have to go and buy you know, a $10,000 rig. They don't have to do that anymore. They actually use Teradici directly to log into the VM in Azure and create their digital assets directly in Azure. And then once they're done, they actually use the K80s uh, to do rendering. Uh, so they're using things like Redshift and Octane to do the ray trace rendering for their digital assets. So all of that is happening in the cloud. Uh, Oceaneering is another one. Uh, they obviously, they, again, they use M60s and K80s as well. Uh, this is a subsea surface engineering company that builds these little submarines underneath the covers, and then that actually goes in and does things like repairs and maintenance uh, for uh, for the uh, uh, for the for the oil rigs. So, a lot of folks have been asking for more and more and more power. And obviously, with NVIDIA's release of uh, Pascal last year, uh, we wanted to make sure that we allow for for that uh, for that increase in uh, uh, you know in, in in performance. And so, we earlier this week we announced NCV2, so the second generation of the compute stack, uh, which is going to be powered by Pascal P100. Uh, and additionally, you're going to be able to get one, two, or four GPUs in a single node. Uh, and additionally, you know, keeping with our sort of tradition of scale out, we're also going to be offering the infinite band infrastructure infrastructure as a back end, second back end network uh, as well. So you're going to be able to t string together multiple GPUs across multiple nodes to be able to do uh, MPI-based jobs uh, or, uh, or AI-based uh, deep learning jobs, training jobs as well. Um, We've doubled the memory from last generation. Uh, we've also doubled the, uh, uh, the disk size as well. Now, since the last generation, uh, we didn't have premium storage on the last generation. Uh, this, uh, this generation uh, in the NCV2, we will have premium storage as standard for all of these VMs, so you can get high IOPS there as well. So, um, you know, we've been doing some testing on these P100s internally, and you know, we've been seeing some incredible performance, uh, you know, in relative to uh, some of the some of the CPU and GPU-based uh, previous infrastructure. We're seeing almost 40x on some workloads, which is which is pretty incredible. Uh, now, P100 offers uh, both double precision, single precision, and half precision uh, uh, workloads, uh, which is going to be pretty awesome. Now, the double precision workloads are much more relevant to the HPC. Uh, uh, Maybe right after? Yep. Uh, so the double precision workloads are very relevant to the traditional HPC apps, things like reservoir, model, uh, reservoir simulation and, and others as well. So uh, that's going to be really, really important here from a P100 standpoint. Um, these are going to be later in the summer. There is actually a link at the end of the deck uh, that you'll be able to go sign up for the preview. Uh, and uh, you know, we look forward to seeing people uh, utilize the new generation of P100s. And they will live side by side with obviously the K80s as well. So we're going to switch tact a little bit. We're going to talk about AI a little bit. Um, and I'm going to invite um, Alex, uh, my colleague on stage, uh, to talk a little bit about AI and what we're doing in that space. Thank you, Karan. Hello, good morning. My name is Alex Sutton. I'm a, pro a program manager on the Azure H H HPC team. I focus on our future HPC infrastructure and solution strategy, in particular now what we're doing around AI and deep, deep uh, learning. Uh, I've, I've been at Microsoft just over 20, 20 years now, and I've really come to appreciate over the last year how AI and deep learning really is fundamentally cha are changing so software, both how we're developing software and understanding data, what users are, are doing, how we're analyzing code, how we're operating so services, as well as the type of applications that we're building for uh, users that take advantage of vision, of speech, of, of uh, text. And at the core, AI is really doing either a, 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 
a prediction or class, classification, and it's enabling these fundamentally new rich, 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 rich apps, new uh, new user ex experiences. It really is changing and impacting every single product at 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 a uh, at my. Microsoft, and I'm really excited how we can take this infrastructure and tools that we're using internally and start to make it available for uh, you and incorporate into your into your uh, apps. When I think about kind of a, a, a AI, here's how here's how I've been thinking about it from the inf infrastructure side. At the top are applications you you want to build. Could be answering questions, relevance in terms of you think about. Uh, in terms of uh, about Bing or uh, search, image class classification, whether it's for aut autonomous driving, identifying uh, medical issues in x-rays or other radi or radiology, thinking about speech, understanding what a user is going to do bef before it happens so you can provide a better answer and a, and a be better experience. Under, underneath that are a set of common algorithms or, or uh, patterns, sequence to sequence, and text analysis, for, for, for ex example. These are then imp in implemented using various tools or what are called a AI for, uh, frameworks, CNTK from uh, Microsoft, Microsoft, TensorFlow, Chainer, whole variety of tools that implement, in the case of deep, deep, deep learning, these neuro neural networks that start to mimic how people make make sense of the world and, and understand things. If you think about a uh, photograph, how I can start with uh, pixels, start understanding shadows, patterns, lines, build it up into a face or or, or an object, rec recognize that, and then make a a decision. Underlying this is a lot of of a computing power, both to build these models, build the un, build the un, un, understanding, powered by CPUs, powered by G, GPUs. In the case of being powered by F, 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 FPGAs, in order to make good AI, you need a lot of data. You need to understand the world, train it for the problems that that you have, and then it's a a, a, con, a continuous loop. I'm using training or data to train my models, test it, or deploy it out out in the world. I'm and then operating on real on real data as it's com, uh, coming in and continuously improving my my uh, mo models. Uh, GPU is becoming increasingly imp important. These are some of the major AI frameworks be, uh, being used. All support G G GPUs now. People have made that uh, transition from CPU to uh, to a G G GPU. Now people are going from how do I operate on one one GPU to how how do I operate on two, on four, on eight GPUs in in, in a machine. It's not quite as easy as I'm going to run on one. Now I'm, I'm going to run on four. You have to rethink how your network works, how you're doing layers, how you're taking advantage of of that scale. The next stage is how do I run even larger models with even more data on multi multiple machines. Many of our teams at Microsoft are starting to work on their training and development on tens of GPUs, on hundreds of uh, G GPUs. We did a paper last, last fall running on a cluster of over 1,000 uh, GPUs at a supercomputing super center in, in uh, Europe. This is where our investments in InfiniBand and the R R RDMA network come, come into play, and why we think about HBC or deep learning as an H H HPC problem. I've been working on our HPC team at, uh, at Microsoft for the past 10, 10 uh, years, and we really do fit into this world and, and bring a lot of experience in how I'm handling large networks, large-scale systems management, handling uh, data. You know, there's a core infrastructure problem down, down, down below that if you don't solve the data scientists, the experimentation, the, the innovation's not, not going to happen. There's kind of two real phases where this takes, uh, takes place. First, on the training and testing as you uh, develop your, your um, uh, models, things that can take, you know, days, weeks, years on a C C CPU can be dramatically accelerated with a G G G GPUs. You know, first again, we're working on one, scaling up to uh, to a, a multiple G, G, a GPUs. We have teams at Microsoft, like the speech models, can take weeks and weeks to uh, run. As we move to the latest NVIDIA G, GPUs, cutting that down in half makes a real I impact for those teams as they can ex experiment and build richer and richer uh, models. On the other side, once I have a model, I do what's called evaluation or, or inference or, uh, or uh, scoring. Here's where you start to think a little bit more about price, price, price and performance and what's going to make sense for your app, 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 
application? Can I run on a, on a, on a C, CPU? Am I going, going to scale? Can I take advantage of, of a GPU? Is it going to help me with a, a, a performance? If you think about Bing, be able to respond instantly with, within a milliseconds to a customer query is, 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 is is really important. If I'm running my AI in, an auto in a uh, car and trying to do aut autonomous driving, evaluating those images c coming in really, really quickly is absolutely, uh, is absolutely cri cri critical. If I think about kind of what our secret sauce is and within uh, my, my, uh, a Microsoft and how we deliver the cognitive uh, services and the customized co cognitive services and Bing and the stuff like if you saw the uh, PowerPoint uh, our real-time tra translation is lots of ex experimentations. There's no secret sauce. There, there's no easy answer to building a AI. It takes a lot of experiments in networking and framework and in, in building your uh, uh, networks, the parameters that that you're uh, using. It takes lots of uh, GPUs and lots of uh, data. What really what we're really try uh, trying to do on the uh, on the Azure side is build a very rich, robust platform to help you build a custom AI. Uh, and it's 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 hard. The infrastructure gets 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 in your way. This is where where I think about training and testing is kind of an HPC problem at the core. If I'm going to be working with with tens or, or hundreds of uh, GPUs, how do I deploy that uh, cluster? How do I get those those VMs deployed? The software that that uh, that that I need and install. Getting the uh, CUDA drivers, the DNN frameworks, any any uh, pipe. Uh, Python dependencies. If I'm doing lots of experimentations, I've got a job scheduling problem. How do I queue the work? How do I run the most important jobs first? Hardware fails. How do I handle fa failures and re re restart a job on another machine so the data scientist or researcher can uh, stay, stay Stay, stay productive. I also need to protect my data and and my code as as. As I'm running it, we're, what we're hearing from a number of uh, customers now is they want to access that rich data that they have about their uh, users. Sometimes there's personal inf information there that that the data scientists or researchers can't see. So how can you go and train a model on real uh, data that the data scientist isn't allowed to go and actually actually look at or isn't allowed uh, to go to and log in on the machine to a uh, a debug. So how can you provide kind of a black box ex, 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 experience so the data, data scientists can ex, 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 experiment but still keep the proprietary, proprietary, proprietary data as, as secure? And once I've done lots of uh, ex, experiments, shut, shut, things done, shut things down so I don't leave a, leave a cluster idle over the weekend and spend, spend too much money. So I'm excited to, to announce to, uh, today is a new service called Azure Batch AI Training. This is one of these names that is kind of highly descriptive or boring because it describes exactly what, what, what we do, which is make it easy to do AI training and testing at scale. Think of it as a managed service that allows data scientists, researchers, any developer that's, that's building or customizing AI to easily tr train and test and do that at, at scale. At the core, it's giving you a cluster of, uh, of G GPUs so you can do more, more in, in, in parallel and with larger and larger uh, da data sets and work with the type of infrastructure that all the teams at, at Microsoft are, are, are using now. What's exciting to, uh, to me is bringing, we're starting to bring the infrastructure and tools that we're doing, that we are using every day to develop our AI, our, our services, and make it uh, accessible to, uh, to you. The service is built on, Azure, on Azure, Azure Batch. We've had this service in production for about four, four uh, years or so. It's really a PaaS service that provides H HPC clusters as, a, as a, a service. Goes and deploys a cluster on a demand with the types of VMs that, 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 that you want, then and goes and schedules the uh, work. Think at, at a very sim, 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 the program model at a very sim, simple level is what executable or script do you want to run? What command line uh, parameters do you want are, are passed to it at runtime? Run Where do you want to run it? On what type of uh, VM? And how much to, ought to run in uh, parallel? There's no additional charge for using Batch or the AI tra training service. You're simply paying for the underlying compute that you uh, use. 
Uh, one of the reasons that, we, uh, that we're do uh, uh, doing this is to provide a richer experience that's really specialized for people that are doing uh, AI training and, and uh, testing. Batch has a lot of, uh, has a lot of uh, power, but it's really targeted at people developing or at people uh, developing ser ser services. So what we thought about is if we were to go and develop a service using batch, what would it look, what would it look, look, look like? How do we, how do we empower data, uh, data scientists, work with a variety of, of, uh, of uh, tools, and what, what do you need? And at, at the core, it's the ability to define a cluster, run a job, access logs, and ex export those uh, models. We focus on doing things around uh, Docker, as you're seeing uh, through like NVIDIA's announcements this, 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 this week, the deep learning our frameworks and dependencies are being packaged as Docker uh, containers, being maintained by the uh, community, so it's very easy to uh, develop with, build a model on your, on your laptop, and then deploy it in a training environment like, uh, a like uh, Azure. Make it very easy to use large numbers of uh, G G GPUs. If you're doing multi-GPU training, install the InfiniBand drivers, make, a a make MP MP MPI work for the GPU to GPU uh, com uh, com uh, communication. We've got a very rich S SDK focused on py Python first, which is how most of the deep learning models are be being uh, uh, developed and most of the, of the community is comfortable writing Pyth Python scripts. We've also got, like most Azure ser services, a REST ap API as well as an SDK for C Sharp and Java, which is really focused on aut automation and, and integration with, uh, with uh, tools. And this is important. We're just part of the of the uh, workflow. We're very good at running jobs at scale. We're not focusing on the end-to-end -end ex uh, experiment management. We're not data scientists ex experts on how on how I go and build the models, how I build build, build the network, how I uh, how I it, iterate. We're working very closely with the data science team at at Microsoft Azure, Azure Machine Learning that is focusing on how do I go and develop these. Uh, deep, deep, deep learning models. How do, how do I tie into an end-to-end -end workflow for experimentation and delivery into, into my apps, as well as working with a number of ex external, external partners and tools and solving kind of this underlying inf infrastructure challenge. Let me go and show you a quick uh, demo of just submitting a job through a script, and I'll walk you through what the API is doing under the covers. What you see here is a Jupyter note, note, notebook. It's a great way of sharing a, a Python code, Python scripts. We're developing all of our uh, tutorials now as Ju Jupyter no notebooks that you can then run uh, locally or run in 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 the Azure uh, the Azure note, 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 notebook service. I'm just going to walk walk you through what a script would look like uh, submitting a job with our uh, service. The API is still being developed, still still being it, iterated, so some of this is going to change. First step is just importing our uh, lib, lib, library, then configuring the uh, client, what Azure subscription am I uh, using. In this case, I'm actually not running in ARM yet. I'm using a local a or an API server that we have deployed for the uh, a demo and custom uh, cr credentials. Next is choosing the framework and container that you want to use. In this case, we're going to use a, C a C CNTK a, 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 a container. One of the things that, that we do is we can uh, mount storage end, endpoints into, into, into the container. In this case, we're going we're gonna to use a GLuster file server that we set up for uh, scalable tra training data, mount that into the container so my code can directly ac access that, as well as using then Azure, Azure files for the out, output logs for the, uh, for the uh, tra training. Next is setting up the, the details of the model that I want to run. Here I've got my model defined in a, uh, in a, a Python, Python, Python script. And I'm going to uh, uh, pass in two, two parameters where the input data is and where the output data should, uh, should uh, live. 
And then we're starting to do further uh, schematiz schematization or sp specialization for each of the, uh, of the uh, frame uh, frameworks. So I'm running CNTK, if I'm running ten ten TensorFlow, how can you describe the specific, uh, what does it mean to uh, ought to run with, with that tool? In, the, in this case, for C CNTK, configuring the runtime that I'm operating with a uh, Python script as opposed to a, a, a brain, brain script script. Go and run that. And then finally, you know, accessing all of those up, up parameters and submitting the uh, job. And we see in a moment, it called into the APIs, some, some submitted the uh, job. Here we're just going to go and run a loop to, to check if the job is running. This job takes about 20 minutes or so to, uh, to uh, run. Typically what you would do now is tail the logs, pipe the out output logs to a tool like, uh, like uh, TensorBoard for um, a monitoring. We make it very easy to expose those logs out from the uh, G GPUs or from the training machines, either, either tun tunneling through if you want to uh, connect over S SSH and look look at the logs or exposing it out to uh, tools like ten, TensorBoard, and then when you're done, go and look at the output the output logs and models from the uh, from the uh, job. Let me switch back and just give you a little bit more detail about what these jobs look uh, look like. So this was just what I showed here was really just the part of of add. Adding a job, there's a broader API for configuring the uh, cluster, reading the logs, and handling uh, handling mo uh, models. Uh, the fir the first step is to describe the resources that you want to uh, run on. You can define a cluster up front that's then used across multiple jobs or mul or multiple uh, users, or if you just want to. To, uh, to submit a uh, single job, the resources are required or the cluster can also be described on a job. So I'm doing experimentation. I may define a cluster because I'm gonna run tens or hundreds of jobs. If I've got a job that's gonna run for days or weeks, I can just, uh, just sub uh, submit it or, and, uh, and, and go. You don't have to create any other spe spe special account. We take care of batch and storage accounts under the uh, covers. Simply, simply tell us what region you, uh, you want to uh, run in, the number, uh, the type of VM that you want to use, an NC6, an NC24R, for, for, uh, for, uh, for example, and then the target number of VMs that you want to start start with. Because the service builds in batch, we can use both standard VMs as well as the low priority VMs that were announced this week. The low priority VMs are kind of the equivalent of uh, spot, spot, spot pricing. When we have excess uh, capacity of, of GPUs, which happens every once, once in a while, we want to make it very easy for you to run at scale at a lower, at a lower cost. We support uh, auto-scaling the, the size of the clusters. You could say set a, set a range from zero to, to, uh, to 100 G, G, GPUs. When there's no work in the queue, we will scale, scale things down. When jobs are submitted, we will start to scale up to the, to the maximum that you, that you uh, spe so specified. And then the last three things are describing the computer environment that you want to uh, run, run on. The virtual machine uh, configuration is the underlying guest OS, Windows, Linux. You could use uh, Ubuntu, the data science VM from uh, Microsoft, includes a bunch of the frameworks built, built in, as well as you, you, you can bring your own custom v VM with your uh, software in installed. The shared volume section is where we, where we can mount a remote fi file system onto the v V, uh, VM, we're working on support for an NFS server, parallel file system like uh, Gluster, as well as Azure, Azure files. The user accounts section is where you specify how, how does someone lo log into one of those machines if uh, necessary, configuration for both Windows and uh, Linux, setting up the admin users, setting passwords, uh, setting up S S S SSH keys as, as, as an example. And then the uh, node is what actually goes and is run on the, or is the further uh, uh, configuration of the machines that, that you're running tra tra training on. If you're using uh, uh, containers, what's the source of the uh, containers? Are coming from Docker Hub and Azure Container 
a registry or, or your own uh, source? And then what storage points do you want mounted in, uh, directly in, into that uh, a container, again, to access the training data or for your out, out, output logs? If a VM image or a container doesn't sat satisfy you, we also have the ability to run a custom setup script or, or a startup script where you can install your own software, Python libraries, configure the machines however you, however you uh, want. Uh, and then simple, op, you know, standard op operations, list, listing clusters, getting status, sizing up, up or down, and deleting when you are uh, when you are done. Just one uh, one comment on the res resize part. If you need to scale down, or say you're using, uh, you know, the uh, low low priority low priority ins instances, we allow you to uh, specify what you do with with uh, with existing jobs. Uh, simply term uh, terminate them and stop. Uh, stop and re queue or wait until the running jobs are uh, done. Once I have the cluster up, I add a, uh, add a job. We've been working with the data science team to think about what's the right uh, taxonomy of describing projects, jobs, uh, ex ex experiments. I may be working with a model and running hundreds of, of experiments. How do I describe what I'm trying, uh, trying to do and think about kind of trees or uh, forks? Is I, I may go and try a bunch of different approaches, a bunch of different ex experiments. How do we start to converge on at least a name on a on a name, name, naming convention, and then a way that different tool, that the the tools can be aware of what I, what I'm trying to uh, do and start to help you understand this mass of data that uh, that I've been. Cr uh, of creating. You specify the cluster that you want to run on, the number of VMs for the job. You can also specify the container on the job if you have custom, uh, custom code for that experiment or run. I can do it on the cluster side or the, uh, or the uh, job, a job side. Again, specifying as I showed in the script, the, the, the tool type that I'm running and any specific configuration for that tool. And then what's the path to the training data, the out, out, output logs, debug logs, I may be starting with a previous model, what's the checkpoint of that, so I can go and start this job part, part, part way through and, and continue ex experimentation uh, down. Just an example of what we're looking at in terms of schema for jobs, if you think about CNTK, again, the key things that tell the runtime, I'm running a, a, brain, a brain script model or a, a Python model. In the case of, of ten, TensorFlow, what's the configuration for the t three types of roles that I can have? You know, the master, the worker, or the per parameter server. What type of VM do I want them running on? And any configuration that needs to be passed through to the uh, to ten, a TensorFlow. Then, you know, how do I manage jobs, list jobs, get a status, cancel, or a delete? Then some of the uh, metadata op 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 operations. How can I log in to the, to the machines, see the models, ex export the models? How can I access logs that are on the machine, on the shared storage, or stream it out to my uh, app? As I said, you know, we're just part of this broader and and. and 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 work, workflow. While the training and the infrastructure is a nece, is a nece, nece, necessary part, if we're doing our jobs well, it's kind of hidden from the users, and and everything works. And that there's a there's another set of tools that they're using to prepare the data, to describe the model, to orchestrate that ex experimentation. And on the other side, I can go and deploy a a, tra a train model, use it in an app, app application as a Rust. REST API, go and do bulk or batch scoring, perhaps with uh, batch, or take that same model and deploy it in a SQL Server and a data lake. So I just want to show you one more quick uh, demo of some work that we've been doing in internally and some tools that we're starting to uh, use for in internal teams to make part of this workflow uh, easier. So what you see here is Vis Vis Visual Studio, where I have Visual Studio tools for Python installed. So if I'm developing a CNTK or TensorFlow model in uh, Py Py Python, I've got the ability for 
uh, in IntelliSense, I can uh, set breakpoints, I can step through and uh, uh, debug my code. Very important to make sure that my models are working first on my, on my local, local machine before I go and run at scale. Once I'm ready to run, run at scale, we've, we've got a team working on what's tentatively being called Visual Studio Tools for AI. Think of it as a cluster uh, front end for, for running jobs. Here I have, you can see the batch AI training service sh showing up. I have a cluster that we created earlier that's got 40 NC6 uh, G G G GPUs. With, with this tool, I can go and submit a job. Let me just import a job I created, I created er earlier. Here you can see, let's see if we can zoom this. Some of the uh, parameters I, I was describing, what cluster do I want to run on, what script am I going to uh, use, the name, the number of VMs that, that I want to use, variety of frameworks that we uh, support, location of the uh, uh, containers, and then the uh, paths to the, the input and output uh, directories. And then down here, one of my favorite fe fe features, if I'm running on, uh, on an experiment I want to do in the HPC rule, what we would call a, a par 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 parametric sweep, in this case, a hyperparameter sweep of I want to go and test, in this case, ten, I want to run 10 different jobs with different values for the mini batch size and whether I'm running in a, di a data parallel or, or not. I didn't have to write a lot of code to, uh, to do this. All I can sim simply do is specify you know, the uh, job ID, the parameters that I want to pa uh, pass in under the, under the cover this tool will go and submit, in this case, 10 jobs across 40 GPUs to the uh, cluster. Let's submit the job and see what it looks like. So they've got the ability to show a heat, heat, heat map, which was not refreshing earlier. So let me just sort of go to the Azure portal and see the jobs already started and running on these 40 uh, G, G, GPUs got the ability to look at the jobs running on the cluster. You can see I've got those 10, 10, 10, 10 jobs started. Now we're starting to do, do work with the Azure M ML team to, you know, how do I manage of, of, of versions of, of experiments or what can I do with export or with, with models of when they're done and bring them into in, in, into production. So we're trying to do for some in, in, internal teams is the ability directly from the uh, tool to publish a model to Azure, Azure ML where they can go and deploy it on a batch, batch, batch a, a cluster for batch evaluation or package it up as a container and deploy it as a REST API using Azure, Azure con, a, a container services. So we're starting to show how you can automate the uh, workflow of of training, of testing, and then deploying the model out to an, 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 an application. Oops. So I hope I've given you a taste of some of the investments that we're making to you know, bring this powerful GPU infrastructure to help people build a, a custom a, AI. We've released, we're doing a limited a, a preview of, this, of the service now, so we can work very closely with uh, customers and their data, data, uh, data science teams. If you're interested, I invite you to go to this URL, read a little bit more about the service, and join our uh, pre preview. Cool. So, Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> so hopefully that gave you a little bit of good idea of you know, the new infrastructure and how you can sort of really, really utilize it. Um, I wanted to spend you know, just a quick few minutes on some of the, uh, some of the interesting um, you know, use cases that will get essentially presented out of this, right? So um, AI you know, is really, really everywhere. Um, you know, whenever you talk to your, talk to your phone, uh, whether it's Katana, Siri, whatever digital assistant that you're talking to, that's all AI inferencing. Um, additionally, you know, when you go to websites, uh, things like Pinterest, that is all image recognition and models that have been trained on these GPUs as well. Um, and then things like recommendation engines where like retail, um, if you're purchasing certain things, um, you know, that retailer will know exactly what to sort of recommend to you at a later stage. Now these are models being trained on behavior that you're doing on these things. 
Um, it's certainly in different industries as well, uh, from a perspective of it really is touching people's lives. Um, you know, now Skype Translator obviously is one example where uh, somebody could speak, uh, you know, a different language to another person uh, across the world and be able to directly communicate with them. Uh, this is, these are all models, language-based models that are built on all of the data using um, AI. Um, this is a pretty interesting one. This is a uh, uh, this is a uh, hospital in LA that's actually using 10 years worth of data um, to actually predict uh, what are the symptoms of certain diseases uh, for 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 kids and babies, uh, which is which is really really cool, right? They've got this mammoth amount of data. They just don't know what to do with it now. They're actually training models to recognize what are the symptoms moving in the future. Um, the, the third one's actually one that you might have already seen, and so there's actually a video on it on YouTube. Uh, this is a person that works for Microsoft, is blind, um, and what he's got here is essentially a camera on his, on his glasses that's taking photos of what's in front of him. Those photos are now then being uploaded into blob storage. They're now then being run through a model, and then inference is running on top of them to recognize what's in front of him, and then it's then being sent back down into a microphone, uh, into a little speaker, uh, sorry, uh, in his ear. And so now what that means is he can actually completely uh, you know, change how he lives, meaning he can actually recognize people's faces. He can actually recognize what kind of emotion they've got on their faces. He can read menus. He can sort of, uh, he can navigate himself. So that's you know, really sort of changing how he uh, interacts with the world. Um, it's fueling all industries. Every industry is using AI in deep learning. Uh, so uh, all the way from airports, where essentially if you've lost your kid, for example, you can go to the security center, um, and then you can actually uh, use image recognition to figure out where uh, your kid was last seen. The second one's actually quite interested, uh, interesting. If you've actually gone to, uh, this is actually a project by Hilton, but if you've actually gone to, uh, if you've actually gone to the Building 99 Microsoft, there's actually a little robot there called Connie, uh, where it's actually able to recognize you and then tell you where your next meeting is. Uh, in this case, this is a hotel concierge, which means that it's able to actually tell you where uh, you know where the next, uh, you know where the greatest sushi place is, and then it's actually able to even then uh, book a table for you. The third one's really interesting. It's called the Lettuce Project. It's online. You can check it out. Um, what it actually does is there's cameras in the front of it, and what it's recognizing is it's actually recognizing if it's a weed uh, or if it's actually the lettuce itself. And if it's a weed, it's spraying just enough pesticide or herbicide to kill the weed. And so this is really changing how uh, you know they uh, they work. So. And then a couple of other customers that we're working with, specifically on our VMs right now, Noonan uh, is changing sort of the financial analysis market by using AI for their workloads on, on these GPUs. Um, they're actually using lots of data from uh, folks like Bloomberg and Reuters, and then they're taking all of that data, uh, putting it into a model using the training that, that, uh, that's happening on these GPUs, and then offering that to second tier banks uh, and final, financial institutions that couldn't afford that data in the first place. So they're actually adding value by using AI and then actually providing analytics to them. Um, Algorithmia is another one. Uh, they actually pre-train the models uh, uh, on, on the GPUs, uh, and then they actually offer a service uh, for developers, uh, which is you know, thousands and thousands of APIs that are inferencing APIs for computer vision, uh, machine learning, uh, image recognition, uh, you name it, they have it. Um, and essentially, they've sort of made a business out of training models and then providing value by providing those a as APIs for inferencing as well. <coughs> Um, now, uh, you know, Alex talked a little bit about um, Cognitive Toolkit, um, you know, previously known as uh, CNTK. Uh, this is Microsoft's open source version uh, of our deep learning toolkit. Um, now, most of, these, most of these things that I kind of talked about were running CNTK underneath the covers, uh, meaning that they're actually using Cognitive Toolkit to train their models uh, and then actually even do the scoring as well. Um, Last year, uh, you know, uh, uh, CNTK or Cognitive Toolkit, you know, reached a milestone, which is uh, human parity on speech, uh, which is pretty incredible, you know, in this day and age, and it's only going to get better from now on as well. Um, and then last supercomputing, uh, Jensen, who's the uh, CEO of NVIDIA, announced the fact that, um, you know, the Cognitive Toolkit is, uh, you know, the fastest on Azure um, and additionally fastest on Pascal. And at the time, we didn't really have Pascal. Now, you know, we obviously announced the P100s, uh, but we also wanted to, you know, cater for the deep learning, AI, machine learning markets as well. So earlier this week, we announced uh, an additional VM size uh, for deep learning specific training purposes, um, and that's the P5. Uh, 
140. Uh, that's the ND-based instances for deep learning. Um, and these are going to be powered by the Tesla P40, uh, which is primarily for single precision-based workloads. Uh, so today, for example, CNTK and some of the other uh, frameworks like TensorFlow and so on and so forth are using uh, what's called FP32, so single precision floating point underneath the covers. And so the reason why we're, we're obviously picking P40 is because of the fact that it offers really good performance on single precision. And once the market and once the frameworks start to move to half precision later in the year, we obviously have the P100 that you can utilize for half precision as well. Uh, so we're giving you really, really good performance there. Additionally, with the model sizes and the data sizes growing really, really large, uh, you know, memory sizes are becoming quite important as well. So one of the other major differences here is that the P40 itself has a 24 gig memory size on top of it, which means you can fit bigger memory sizes. And then with the high bandwidth uh, uh, of the GPU itself, you can push through a lot of data in here uh, and do really large scale training. So again, um, as with the P100 SKU, um, you know, you're going to be able to get one up till four. Uh, and then you know, as uh, Alex talked about some of the distributed training workloads, uh, you're really going to be able to utilize the infinite band infrastructure in this case. Uh, so again, we now have the first one, which is the NCV2, the second generation of traditional compute uh, for CUDA, OpenCL uh, type workloads in the P100 generation, uh, and then now the P40 as well. So we did do uh, some benchmarks uh, on Cognitive Toolkit uh, and CAFE. We picked two, uh, uh, two just uh, uh, you know, frameworks there. And then we saw almost two, two X uh, performance in single precision training uh, on some of the different networks. Um, you know, we're obviously seeing uh, quite a bit more performance in some of the things like ResNet uh, and AlexNet as well. So uh, you know, we really think that uh, the P40 is going to allow for, for all of that. Now, Apart from the training capabilities on the P40, uh, what's also going to be really cool is the inferencing uh, uh, side of it. Now, it does have int8 capability, the P40. So what that means is you're going to be able to run inferencing right on the same chip as well. So you have a single VM with a single P40 or multiple P40s. You're going to be able to run training and then inference right on top of it right after that, which is pretty fantastic. So we're seeing a massive speed up of training performance, uh, sorry, inference performance from the previous generation K80 now to the P40 because of the specific performance capabilities on the P40. Um, obviously, this is a, a, a showcase in K80 versus P40. In this case, uh, uh, you know, the K80 is obviously that half, uh, that half card. Um, so this is really going to enable some of the large-scale services to build on top. You know, I talked about Algorithmia earlier on. Um, this is the kind of hardware that they're going to be running on top of to deploy massive-scale uh, inferencing services. Now, obviously, you know, everything is an inferencing uh, device, right? Your phone is an inferencing device, for example, where, where you're talking to an AI. Uh, but in the case of really running a large-scale multi, uh, you know, multi-tenant system, you're going to be able to use uh, a P40 GPUs both for training um, and inference as well. So um, as Alex mentioned, um, you know, the AI services in preview, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the P40s and the P100s are going to be uh, previewed later in the year. Uh, during summer time frame, we're going to be announcing a little bit more details uh, in the coming weeks. Um, there's actually uh, uh, the, uh, a website as well that you can go and uh, if you look at the blog post from earlier on Monday, uh, there is a link there for you to go sign up for the preview uh, so that we can invite you and, and, and run some testing, run some benchmarks, uh, benchmarks and then uh, we'd love to hear feedback, um, obviously, um, on these things as well. So I think we've left about three to five minutes uh, for some questions. Uh, so, you know, please uh, feel free to um, ask anything. Alex and, and me are available for questions. Hello? Yes, please. Hello? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I saw your uh, benchmark of the, the P40 and the K80 on the uh, CNTK and the CAFE. Uh, it's amazing uh, performance. Uh, uh, did you do any benchmark on the TensorFlow on your platform? We have not. Um, uh, I know there's, there's uh, our internal guys are, in fact, I mean, you know, we, I mean, as, as I mentioned, right, like, as actually Alex mentioned, that we're going to support every framework. Um, it's not that, you know, one framework's better than the other. Even our internal teams are actually using TensorFlow internally as well. So um, although we haven't showed any framework benchmarks for TensorFlow, uh, we can certainly publish those as well. But we're seeing some great performance numbers throughout the, you know, throughout the stack. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how about comparing with your uh, Azure uh, uh, HPC capacity with the, the TPU capacity? Yep. Uh, so as I mentioned, right, like earlier in the, in the in the talk, that capacity is definitely a challenge because of the the high demand. But um, as you saw my map, 
we're going to be ex expanding pretty aggressively throughout um, uh, throughout the sort of uh, global 38 regions um, to, to make sure that we have uh, capacity everywhere. Sorry, my question is uh, comparing uh, the, the Google TPU. Uh, sorry, TPU. Right. right, right. Yeah. So I mean, TPU is a you know an inferencing chip, right? So it is very tightly coupled to some of their workloads internally. Now, TPU, as far as I know, um, I haven't read into it, but as far as I know, it's not available as a customer programmable piece of hardware. Right. What we're offering here is an infrastructure, so you're actually having physical devices in your hand, uh, whereas that they're, they're actually offering you know, services on top of the TPU, so to speak. So uh, there's a major difference in how you access that technology. So um, you can't directly access uh, a TPU today, but I don't know, maybe it'll... And our, our analog there is what we're doing with F F FPGA is to right. power both Bing and the cognitive services. We're using these specialized things first to get greater scale and performance for our internal services and looking at how we provide that available for custom code too. Sorry. I'm hoping no question is a stupid question today because the, the presentation kind of made me feel like I'm more at the halfway between 100 and 200 level with this topic. Sessions have been transcribing what you say almost in real time. <laughs> Does that come from the uh, cognitive services research? This no. This is is actually a a a, a person do, are doing it. Okay. But what you saw on Tuesday in Harry Shum's a keynote was yep. live and real, being done through AI trained in uh, Azure. How close are you to the person, given the speech recognition? Um, Parody. Pretty close. Pretty close. I mean, check yeah. out Chris.ai. Um, it's one of the new services that is sort of getting to that sort of, uh, you know, that delta is being reduced more yeah. and more. What, what, Course.ai? What did you say? Chris, C R I S. C R I S. Dot Chris. AI. Yeah. yeah. And what, what's interesting about Chris is it actually it, was, it came first to how do I transcribe ac 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 academic talks? And it takes someone's paper and power. PowerPoint trains on that. You can do like 15 minutes of training and dramatically increase the accuracy of sort of jargon and language. And it kind of shows what a a generic speech recognition model can can do than what a little bit of of customization can uh, can uh, cool. do. Thank you. Hey, I saw your K80 versus P100 graph, and I noticed most of the values went up by 10 to 40 percent. But I also noticed that you were comparing. 2K80s to 4P100 graphics cards. That's correct. So those 2K80s are the two full boards. So it's okay. really four, yeah. four GPUs yeah. against so four GPUs. So it's actually the same number of physical yes. graphics yes, cards. Yes, correct. I should have pointed that out, but it is two full physical boards. Yeah, so two K80s, yeah. When I thought, thought about it, I was like, are you getting a double yeah. compute for the same price? <laughs> or yes, are the correct. new ones actually sometimes rightly, slower? Yeah, <laughs> rightly pointed out. So yeah, on the bottom there, we were saying that, yeah, it's two full physical boards. So it's four GPUs versus four P40. So that would be essentially the NC24, which is four GPUs exposed, the full server box, versus the ND24. OK, so it's two complete two GPU graphics cards on each case. Yes. So it is yes. a one to one comparison. Yep. It is a one to one comparison. <laughs> Correct. Four, four yep. to four. <laughs> yep. Correct. Four to four. Yeah, that's right. Hi. You, you mentioned that uh, uh, the speech recognition uh, error rate has exceeded human. <coughs> what, does, what does that even mean? Like, can, what it means, what it means is bit? that what it means, like in literal terms, essentially that um, you know the, the the models are getting so complex and so smart that they're able to essentially rival a human actually hearing the talk and transcribing it themselves. So the error rate so, is getting so, smaller and smaller. So what what you would be seeing here mm -hmm. would be exactly as if a human were transcribing. That's right. So what I mentioned there, right in the in the article, there was 5.7 percent um, yeah. delta. So basically, with 5.7 percent of uh, error rate, you'll be able to get, you know, essentially as a transcribing. And that 5.7% is a human error, meaning that if a person were 5.7 uh, error, error within human, uh, uh, oh, oh, right. Within, yeah. within human, oh, within human, to a, human to comparison. A human. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I had one more question. This is unrelated to my previous one. It, when I'm developing a parallel GPU-based program, I probably want to be able to run on small data sets cheaply, but have access to the physical GPUs with the same 
development environment and runtime requirements of the full load just to see if I actually process yeah. the data correctly, but I really don't care. And I want like cheap GPU, but works the same. Low priority. Yeah, well, yeah, so there's, what you want to do is work on the same GPU and the same environment. Start with small data first so I can get fast it, iteration, see how, how my model is uh, working. If you want to run a lot of experiments in parallel, that's where the low priority OVMs come, come into play. Is it also possible to develop for this platform on my home desktop where I have a much lesser GPU? Yes, yeah, and so uh, typically people will start on their desktop or, or laptop first. You can start with, say, a Titan X G GPU and then run the same environment at scale in uh, Azure. And that's where uh, containers are very nice is you can be sure that the libraries and the environment are the same. Go and ship that to uh, Azure and then just run. And the containers are um, running on my local machine would be also how I test the setup yes. scripts that can automatically convert exactly. your image into what I want to run. Yep. <clears throat> yep.